Chapter 14 It was sundown by the time Pat Stevens and Ezra were able to get away from the K.T. Ranch without hurting the feelings of Katie Rollins. She seemed pathetically anxious to have them stay, finding them sympathetic listeners when she told them of the manifold troubles that had come to the ranch after her father's death. She insisted that Juana should start a fire in the kitchen range and cook a huge meal for them, and she kept finding reasons for them to delay their departure while she talked eagerly about the chances of Ben Thurston still being alive and about them finding in Brocco and bringing back the man who called himself Dusty to her that morning. Pat finally explained that they'd best be riding in that direction if they wanted to find the young rider, and Katie reluctantly agreed they'd better get going. At the barn, Pat told Miguel to saddle their own two horses and asked him to take care of Dusty's two mounts until they returned, explaining to Ezra, Our horses are fresher after not being ridden all night, and I've got a hunch Dusty would like to find his here. You reckon then that Dusty's still alive? Ezra demanded as they rode away from the barn. It was the first chance they had to discuss the situation without being overheard since meeting Katie. I'm sure he is. That had to be Dusty. The fellow that jumped Lawn Boxley in Hermosa this morning and rode back here with that Rollins girl. Well, it sounds like him all right, Ezra admitted. But you heard her description of the clothes he was wearing, Pat. And how come he hit Hermosa on foot dressed that way? And who's that feller laying dead in the stagecoach? We know Dusty was riding on that stage. We know he started out from Marfa on it, Pat admitted. But you heard her say that Dusty told her he had traded clothes with another fella down the line. Here's the way I figure it. Dusty didn't know whether he was being followed from Marfa by a posse or not. I reckon there was another passenger on the stage when he got on. A fellow about his age and size, dressed in dudish clothes. Ben Thurston? Ezra surmised excitedly. Yeah, Ben Thurston. He was due in from Colorado on that stage. So I reckon Dusty figured he'd be smart to sort of disguise himself, and he must have got Ben to trade clothes with him in some way. Then I reckon he got off the stage along the way and got himself a horse and rode to Mord's Hermosa, so figure no harm was done. But the stage was held up and Ben Thurston killed, dressed in Dusty's clothes. Yeah, that adds up all right. Then Ezra looked at Pat accusingly. You knew all about Ben coming here from the first. That's why you was in such a hurry to get here. And you never told me nothing about it. Pat grinned at him. Well... Sort of ashamed to tell you the whole truth. It sounded kind of silly. Like we was just kids again with nothing else to do but ride a few hundred miles for the fun of it. And I didn't know how anything would work out either. For all I knew, the gal might not be in any real trouble. And then you just laughed at me and I do want to buy some heifers. Well, how'd you know about Ben and that Rollins growl? Pat told him about Ben giving him the letter to Katie Rollins at the Lazy Mare Ranch. And he showed Sally and me a picture of Katie, he told Ezra. It sort of got a hold of us. It was Sally who pushed me into it, and now you know about as much about everything as I do. He turned in the saddle to look back at the Katie Ranch house. In the soft haze of twilight, it was barely discernible behind them. Pat said... I reckon no one can see us if we turn off now. Where to? To the XL Ranch. I got a hankering to see this Lawn Boxley. What for? Ezra grunted suspiciously. Just looking at him gives me a yearning to start shooting, and I couldn't be responsible. You heard what he said about buying heifers. Said he had some for sale. Pat swung to the right across the road at the Ford Creek. I reckon we can cut across this way and hit the XL Ranch. 
You don't want none of that hungry, gaunt stuff we saw on the road. They'd never stand up for a drive back to the Powder Valley. I want to find out what he meant. Sounded kind of like he had an ace up his sleeve or perhaps a pair of them. Where do you figure he fits into everything, Pat? I don't really know. I got a hunch he's kind of sweet on Katie Rollins or is making her to think he's sweet on her. You don't reckon she'd fall for a man like that, do you? No man ever really knows what a girl will do. She's crazy enough about the KT Ranch to do almost anything to keep going. Well, don't know as I blame her. Ezra sighed enviously as he took in the serenity beauty of the River Bottom Ranch, though through which they'd been riding. This here makes all the rest of the Big Ben look like a bad dream. Pat nodded and said, That's what's got me guessing certain things. There's another road cutting down across it, leading to another one of the three fords, I reckon. If we turn the other way on it, I'm betting we'll ride right into the XL layout. They turned to their right on a road leading directly across the KT away from the river. As it grew darker, they crossed the road from Hermosa to the ranch and rode on towards the rim rocks looming darkly ahead of them. At the foot of the limestone cliffs, they found another wooden gate barring the road that had been cut upward along the side of the cliff. When their horses came out on top a few minutes later, it was quite dark and Pat indicated a light some miles ahead of them. That'll be the XL headquarters. From what Katie told us this afternoon, let's get going. They spurred their horses into an easy lope. The light grew brighter as they neared it, and as solid darkness came on. After a time, it resolved itself into a lit window of a frame building set in the middle of a malicinated collection of rickety sheds and corrals. A man hailed them from one of the corrals as they rode up. Who is it? Pat pulled up and called out. We're looking for Lon Boxley. All right, but who are you? The voice growled back. A man came towards him in the direction and Pat saw he was carrying a rifle across the crook of his arm. Name's Pat Stevens, he said. Cow buyer from Colorado Boxley told me to come up this afternoon. Why didn't you say so? The man grumbled. He gestured towards the lit window with the muzzle of his rifle. Boss is in there. They trotted up into the yard and dismounted. Pat led the way to a door a few feet from the lit window and knocked loudly. He heard heavy steps inside, and then the door opened a crack and Boxley's voice asked, Who is it? Men from Colorado that's wanting to be buying heifers. Boxley opened the door up wide and said, Come on in then. He stepped away from the door, and Pat and Ezra entered a small square room that showed the dirt and disorder of bachelor usage. The bare pine floor was grimy, and there was greasy supper dishes on the table in the center of the room. Pat said to Boxley, You're mighty cautious about letting visitors into the ranch. I thought we was going to be getting asked for a password. Well, man can't be too careful here in the Big Ben. Boxley was in his shirt sleeves and his breath smelled of whiskey. He nodded ungraciously towards a couple of broken back chairs. Sit down and rest your feet. I thought you were riding across the river to see about buying your stuff over there. We've changed our mind. Wanted to hear your proposition first. He and Ezra sat down. Boxley remained standing. He frowned and asked, How do I know you're really cattle buyers from Colorado? You could pretty easily check up on us, Pat told him shortly. Well, it ain't exactly unlegal, my proposition ain't. You're just looking for heifers, huh? Mostly heifers would buy almost anything, though, I reckon, if we were given a good enough bargain. Wouldn't we, Ezra? Sure, if it was cheap enough. 
Boxley nodded with satisfaction. Well, you've come to the right place for a bargain. He went to the end of the room and rummaged under a pair of clothes and pulled out a gallon of half full of tequila. He set it on the table and said, I'll go get some cups, and disappeared around the side door into the kitchen. Ezra looked at Pat and made an appreciative smack and sound with her lips. Pat grinned rarely and started to roll a cigarette. Boxley came back with three tin cups. He poured each of the cups half full and offered one to each of his guests, saying, Talking business is pretty dry work without a sniffer to wash her down with. There's salt here on the table if you want some. Pat and Ezra shook their heads. Pat took a cautious sip and Ezra took a gulp. He sputtered and blinked back a few tears and muttered, That's real good. Boxley picked up a salt shaker from the table and carefully shook a little salt onto his tongue and then he drank the half cup of fiery Mexican liquor. Holding his breath, he put more salt on his tongue and swallowed, and then exhaled loudly. Ain't so bad if you salt her down, he explained, then went on abruptly. I got myself in a damn fool jam by trying to be smart. Got a lot of stuff on the other side of the border I gotta get rid of for cash. How much stuff? About three or four hundred head, all told. Maybe half of them are heifers. What kind of a jam? Like I say, it ain't exactly unlegal, except that the Mexican government is trying to make me trouble. Boxley sat on a corner of the table, frowning at him. You know anything about Mexican law? Not a damn thing. Well, I'm just learning. Here's the way it stands. No American citizen is allowed to own any land or stock in Mexico. I've heard that. Things got a mite bad down there on my range last year. and You rode over most of it today and you can see we've had a bad drought for years. Pat nodded again he took another sip of tequila. His expression was receptive. There was some mighty good grass right on the other side of the border that was going to waste. I saw a chance to save some of my stuff. I fixed it with the Mexican who owned that ranch over there to take my stock and graze them. He didn't have any money to buy them, and I didn't want to sell anyway, so we fixed a deal to get around the government law, the one about no Americans owning Mexican stock. He paused to look inquiringly at his guests. Ready for another drink? Pat shook his head, but Ezra got to his feet and ambled towards the jug. I believe I'll try it with a shot of salt this time. Boxley replied, Help yourself. He went on to Pat. We worked out a brand for him to register in his name for Mexico. A brand that mine could be easily turned into easy. You take an XL, he explained, getting a stubby pencil and a piece of paper on the table, like this, and he drew a big XL on the paper. That there's my brand. You draw a straight line down through the X, that makes a six-pointed star of it, and then run the bottom part of the L over to the left, and draw a line under the top, same as the bottom, and connect the two ends to those tops and bottom lines with straight lines. That gives you a figure of one in a box. Draw a straight line across the middle of that one, and you got a cross in a box, see? He showed his diagram on paper to Pat and held it so Ezra could Google it over his tin cup. Out there makes a star box cross brand, he explained. That's the way we registered it in Mexico, and I cut out about half of my stuff and slept them across the river at night. We changed the brands, and there they were in his pasture, getting fat opposed to starving on my side, and left me enough grass to keep the other half of my stock alive. Well, sounds reasonable enough. What's come up now? 
Them damn Mexicans, Boxley greeted. They smell a rat about em, owning a herd like that all of a sudden. And we plan to just drive em back at night when my grass got good again, but we can't do that now. The Raleigh's are watching that herd night and day. Doesn't look like your grass is any good yet anyhow, Pat objected. Boxley smiled thinly. You rode down over the Katy spread, ain't ya? Yeah, we ate supper at the ranch. Well, there's plenty of good grass there going to waste. There sure is. That's where I figure on putting my star box cross herd. You see, I'm taking over the KT outfit. Is that so? And Ezra set down the jug with a loud thump and glowled at the rancher. Yeah, the Rollins girl needs a man to take over for her. Pat slowly began rolling another cigarette. But you can't drive the stuff back like you planned because the Mexican Ruales are guarding it? Well, they're not exactly guarding it, but they're keeping a pretty good watch. There'll be hell to pay if they ever found out the deal I pulled. So now, I gotta sell the stuff for cash. The money will be paid over to my Mexican friend to make it look all proper, and he'll pass it on to me. That way, nothing could ever be proved. You'll have to take a short price selling them that way. Oh, I know I will. That's the bargain I'm talking about. You see, I can't afford to have any trouble here on the border with the Raleigh's, and now I'm taking over the KT. I'll be needing their help to stop the smuggling that's been going on. Pat nodded abruptly. Well, sounds like a good deal to me. How about you, Ezra? The one-eyed man hiccuped loudly. He turned his head back and opened his mouth wide and shook a shower of salt into his mouth. Tears came into his eyes as he swallowed and gulped. Sure, he managed to say. Sure, sounds good enough to me. When can we see the stuff? Pat asked Boxley. Sooner the better. Why not tonight? I gotta ride over to Baracko anyway to see a man about something else. We can head over right away. Well, it suits me. But if the stuff ain't fat, I don't want any part of it. It's a hard trip trail herding up to Colorado from here. They're in mighty good shape, Boxley assured him. They'll stand the trip good, been fattening up on Mexican grass for almost a year now. I'll get my jacket. He hurried from the room. Ezra rounded the table and approached Pat cautiously. He's a slick one, he warned in a deep rumble. You watch your step, Pat, else you'll get burned. Pat Stevens laughed recklessly. I'm not swallowing his story whole hog, he assured Ezra. I don't know what the deal is, but I figure he ain't telling all the truth. We'll trail along with them and keep our eyes open and our mouths shut. He added harshly as Ezra turned back to the tequila jug. This night's work is going to be needing a clear head. Ezra turned with an injured expression. That's what I was calculating and that's why I thought I'd better take another little drink with a shot of salt. Don't seem like it could make a man drunk that way. Boxley came back into the room wearing his silver decorated buckskin jacket at that moment, and Ezra regrettably passed up another drink. Boxley blew out the lamp, and they went outdoors together. End of chapter 14.